Shohei Otani is a once in a lifetime kind of talent, and that might honestly be kind of underselling him a bit. Since making his debut in 2018 at the age of 23, in 581 games, Otani has slashed 267, 354, 532 for an 886 OPS with 127 home runs. Now he does have the tendency to strike out a little bit, but he kind of makes up for it by getting walked a bunch. And overall, he holds a career 137 WRC plus and 13.3 F war. Oh yeah, and uh, that's just his hitting. You know, he's pitched two actually about 350 innings with a 296 ERA and a 304 FIP, getting a ton of strikeouts and keeping the walks right about average. Overall, holding a career 70 ERA minus, 71 FIP minus, and 9.6 F war just from his pitching for a total of 22.9 in five seasons. Now that obviously includes the shortened 2020 season. So in a 162 game average, he sits at 6.4 F war a season. For reference, five war is all-star level and eight war is MVP. All of this is why he's been the 2018 rookie of the year in all-star each of the last two seasons finished fourth in Cy Young voting and second in MVP voting in 2022 and won the 2021 MVP. Now we all know that Otani set to hit free agency after the 2023 season here. And there are reports out there that agents are saying he could get a deal well over half a billion dollars. We're talking Dr. Evil kind of money here. Now the Angels should be able to pay this kind of a contract to him. Their payroll currently sits in an estimated $203 million, seventh in the league, and Otani himself makes up $30 million of that, so they already have that money to put towards re-signing him. He would be their third big money contract that they've given out because they have Trout signed through the 2030 season and Rendon signed through the 2026 season. Now, obviously, the Angels want to re-sign him. Like, why would you want to let a player like this go? The problem is that they haven't made the playoffs since 2014. So what they need to do to keep him is pretty obvious. They need to win and they need to win early this next season before they have to make a big decision come the trade deadline. Last year, this team finished 73 and 89. They have Houston at 106 and 56 and Seattle at 90 and 72 in the division above them as well as Texas, who sat at 68 and 94 below them. Houston is obviously still one of, if not the best teams in baseball, and Seattle made a handful of moves to get better, as well as their young core should take a step forward. And you have Texas, who after signing a couple big position players last offseason, completely redid their rotation this year, adding Jacob deGrom along with a handful of other arms. So this could shape up to be one of the toughest divisions in baseball this year. And yeah, obviously Oakland's in the division too, but Oakland is being Oakland right now. So whatever. But now, so how do the Angels look headed into 2023 here? Last season, their offense was 23rd in OPS and 21st in WRC+. So towards the bottom offensively, they managed to slug a little bit. They were 10th in isolated power, but where they really struggled was getting on base. They were bottom 10 in walk percentage and dead last in strikeout percentage. Now, pitching wise, their starters were 9th in ERA, but 17th in fielding independent pitching because they struggled with their command, allowing the 25th worst walk percentage. The bullpen, on the other hand, was 18th in ERA and 27th in fielding independent pitching. They were about average with the walks, but where they really struggled was strikeouts, 22nd in strikeout percentage. And finally, the defense behind them was 17th in defensive runs saved and outs above average, and Fangraphs had them as a 22nd best defense in baseball last year. So obviously, there are some things the Angels need to address this year if they're gonna really compete in this division and potentially make a playoff spot here. Now to address this and replace the free agents that they lost, starter Michael Lorenzen, reliever Archie Bradley, and infielder Matt Duffy, the Angels went out and signed starting pitcher Tyler Anderson, infielder Brandon Drury, outfielder Brett Phillips, and a handful of relievers, including Matt Moore. 
And they made a couple of trades to get outfielder Hunter Renfro and infielder Gio Urshela. Now we talked about the Angels as a whole and what they need to improve on, but how they're going to do this really comes down to the guys that make up the team and more specifically their key players they're gonna have to rely on. And there's no more key player on this team to start with than Mike Trout. Now Trout has dealt with injuries throughout his career and last year he had this back condition pop up, but go ahead and look at his numbers. When he's played, he's still Mike Trout, injuries or not. Now he played in 36 games in 2021 and 119 last season, managing to play through that back condition a little bit. And he recently said that it hasn't really bothered him this off season. So his health is gonna be really important, obviously, to how well the Angels are gonna do this year. Now their other big money guy in their lineup is Anthony Rendon, and he's faced pretty much the same problem as Trout here, managing his health. He's played in only 105 games the last two seasons, but if he can manage to get healthy again and be the player he was before that was consistently putting up 140, 150 WRC plus seasons from 2017 to 2020, now you have probably one of the better trio of hitters in the major leagues. Now for the depth around these guys in the lineup, you have a couple of potential, we can call them boom or bust type players here. Taylor Ward put up a career high 137 WRC plus last year, but that was his first year playing over 100 games in his career. Brandon Drury is a career 93 WRC plus hitter, but last year put up a 123 WRC plus, his first season of more than 100 games since 2019. So both of these guys need to go out and prove that these weren't just fluky seasons. Jared Walsh is also another potential big bat in this lineup. He put up a 126 WRC plus in 2021, but he had a 78 WRC plus this last year with both his strikeout and walk percentages getting worse. So if he can correct his approach and get it more back to what it was in 2021, maybe we see him bounce back and be another solid bat for the Angels. Now for some more stable depth in the lineup, you have Hunter Renfro who's put up a 113 and 124 WRC plus with two and 2.5 F4 the last two years. And Gio Urshela has been a 799 OPS and a 119 OPS plus hitter in 435 games from 2019 through 2022. And finally, the real wild card here is top prospect Logan Ohapi who's projected to be the opening day catcher for this team. In 117 games at AA from 2021 to 22, he's hit a 943 OPS with 29 home runs and almost walked as much as he struck out. So if the Angels are going to have a well-balanced lineup here, they're going to really need him to carry the success on early in the major leagues. No pressure, kid. Now in the rotation, you have Patrick Sandoval who put up a 291 ERA and a 309 FIP in his first full season. So they need him to avoid a sophomore slump this season, mainly by improving his walk rate, which sat at 9.4% last year, noticeably above average. You also have Tyler Anderson, who they signed coming off of a career year last year with the Dodgers, a 257 ERA and a 331 FIP, but he sits at a career 416 ERA and 418 FIP. So maybe the Dodgers figured something out that he can carry forward, or maybe they just performed some black magic on him. And if you're an Angels fan, you gotta hope that it's he figured something out. Jose Suarez has put up a 386 ERA and a 401 FIP in 207 and a thirds innings over the last two years. So he should be a pretty solid middle of the rotation kind of guy for him. Reed Detmers also put up a 377 ERA and a 379 FIP in his first full season last year. So he's got to repeat this to be pretty similar here to Suarez, more a middle rotation guy. But if he takes a step forward, maybe we're looking at possibly your third, second kind of starter in the rotation. The bullpen is interesting here in that they don't really have anybody that's the bona fide closer. Nobody that got a whole lot of save opportunities last year. So maybe somebody steps up or maybe then at the deadline, if they can be competitive here, that's one of the big moves they go out to make to show Shohei that like, hey, we're willing to go for it. Now, one last big factor in how the Angels are gonna do before the deadline 
is their schedule. So do they have a fairly easy schedule or is it gonna be real tough sledding for them? First, in their division, they have to play Seattle six times, Oakland and Texas seven times, and Houston 10 times. They also play the AL East, facing Baltimore four times, the Yankees and Blue Jays six times, and Boston seven times. They'll face AL Central teams Cleveland, Minnesota, and Detroit three times, Kansas City six times, and the White Sox seven times. In the NL Central, they'll play Milwaukee, St. Louis, the Cubs, and Pittsburgh three times. From the NL East, they'll play the Nationals and the Marlins three times each. And from the NL West, they'll play Colorado, Arizona, and the Padres three times, and the Dodgers four times. Overall, they have 41 games versus who I would call probable contenders. You have teams like Seattle, Houston, the Yankees, Blue Jays, Cleveland, Cardinals, Padres, and Dodgers. And they have 25 games versus teams that are probably going to be more towards the bottom. This is the teams like Oakland, Detroit, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, the Nationals, and the Rockies. Their last 40 games are against teams that are probably going to be more in the middle here. You have teams like Texas, Baltimore, Boston, Minnesota, both Chicago teams, Milwaukee, Miami, and Arizona. So all of this said, do I think that the Angels are going to be in a very clearly competitive spot at the deadline? I think that's going to be really tough to pull off. They're going to need a lot to go right here for them with health when you're talking guys like Trout and Rendon, as well as the consistent play. We talked about Taylor Ward, Drury, and Walsh as well as their strength of schedule isn't that much in their favor. They have way more games against teams that are probably near the top of the league versus teams that are in the bottom. And I don't think that they're that much better than any of the other teams in the middle where they can really separate themselves like that. All in all, I think it's going to be really tough at the deadline for the Angels to say, yes, we're clearly one of the better teams and we can make a real run at this. So we need to add on to show Otani that we can really go deep in the playoffs. I think it's much more likely that they're going to be in a situation where the smarter move is probably going to be to actually trade Shohei and get as much back for him as you can. That being said, I don't know if they end up actually making that move. So with all of this said, how do you think the Angels end up doing in the first half and do they end up trading Shohei or not? I think the worst spot that the Angels could find themselves in would be being stuck right in the middle without a clear path to really follow here. Now we've actually been watching the Red Sox be in this position for the last couple of years here, not really seeming to have a clear plan as to where they're headed. To learn more about that, check out this video right here. And as always, have an awesome day. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.